Yeah, this thing tells us a lot of positive information, and then six hours later, we don't have a show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and I'm joined in the studio today with Ian from Full Throttle Battery. Oh, way to just jump right in there, buddy. <laughs> I was like, "What is he doing?" Uh, yeah, so it's been a little while since we've been in the studio. Um, had a lot of things going on. What's been going on in your neck of the woods? Uh, just busy, man. We recorded two shows, and uh, they got corrupted. I don't even remember what the heck we <laughs> talked about. I think that was back in like December or freaking. It was January, actually. It just seems like it was so far was away. Was it January? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh yeah we had yeah, an episode been with uh, no video after a few minutes that was interesting <laughs> <laughs> so um anyways uh you just uh got back from a trip over to oregon uh goons in the dunes how'd yep. that go oh it was awesome man that was uh biggest turnout yet uh i want to i couldn't even tell you how many people showed up but a lot of fast guys i think there were more wrecks on the dunes than there was at dune fest so it's a great weekend. <laughs> so I uh, just hope people uh, that are joining us for the first time on this topic, Goons in the Dunes is something kind of that's been going on for a long time out in Oregon. Um, and I think the guys that started uh, TakeOver kind of started it originally and then it kind of fell off and then got taken back up. And um, Yeah, so it was, uh, it was an invite thing that got done towards the end of February and then it didn't happen the next year. So I went to it when, when that invite thing came out. And it, like I said, it didn't happen next year. So I was just like, well, that was such a good time. I'm going to throw it out on New Northwest UTV Forum and uh, you know, invite some of the industry insider guys. And next thing you know, two years later, it's kind of officially a thing. Uh, I started calling it Goons in the Officially, Dunes. unofficially, oh, oh, official. un 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 Unofficially official. Uh, I started calling it Goons in the Dunes like two years ago or something like that. And then this year, I'm like, you know what? Let's just invite everybody. And uh, Umqua, the new cap campground development. Or the I'll recently get updated there. I can Umqua. I can enunciate. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, they they did a whole revamp on their campground, and uh, it was it's all like packed double up. size. Oh yeah, yeah, it was all packed up. I think the condos were all sold out. Half Moon across the uh, across the road uh, wasn't sold out, but there's quite a few people there. And yeah, yeah. there's quite a few spots over at Half Moon, but they're all yeah. like hard to get to when it's wet and muddy and nasty. Yeah, it was a blast though, absolute blast. My car tapped out during a night ride, but still had a great time. When you say tapped out, what do you mean? Means it went into limp. Well, it grenaded a belt, went into limp mode, and wouldn't get itself out of limp mode. So it uh, basically what happened is, you know, after a few days, guys get to chit chatting and stuff. And Goons in the Dunes is the event that I mean, there's a lot of guys that are really fast in the Pacific Northwest, and a lot of them show up to this event. So there's no shortage of fast guys out there, and things get competitive. You get you get to battle and you get to chit chatting, and some of that took place. And I was uh, I was at the bottom of a dune when. Uh, we went out on a night ride and my little passenger, my little girlfriend was with me and I'm like, no, we're going to let them all go. We're going to let them all go. We're going to take off in last place. And within about three quarters of a mile, I was following the leader <laughs> in second place and the car didn't like that. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's getting all reset now. It's got some, uh, we got a little thing going on that I'm going to keep hush hush, but it's, it's going to be pretty pretty bitching for so sure a quick rundown on your car it started as a 19 x3 rc uh with 172, 172 yeah. yeah and then uh you've done some upgrades to it with some with some tuning but also uh over time you've now added some uh bolt-on upgrades what have you done uh it's got the big turbo kit i can't remember what they call it the desert storm 320 or the desert storm 340 kit from evo uh, uh head studs bed delete um what else been done to it done by uh tgm motorsports down in pasco and it uh, shout out to burning guys. yeah for sure no it did a heck of a job on that thing um i want to say they swapped over the secondary um different injectors intake plenum we figure it was probably putting down and it's running on e85 right now and it's putting down we figure somewhere between about 265 give or take and uh Fixing to be a lot more, man. So you uh, posted a picture of a bunch of E85 in the back of your truck. Yeah. Um, how much did you buy and how much did you leave with? Uh, I bought 40 gallons for $500. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of the E85 guys here in the Northwest just run run pump. 
and they just test it. And as long as it tests good, they run it in their car and their car's never had a problem with it. So I'm probably going to go that route because that's only like three, four, three fifty a gallon. So how much did you come back with? <laughs> uh, well, I was plan I was on pace to not come back with a drop. And then the car tapped out because Saturday was the big ride day and my car didn't move on Saturday. Um, I want to say I have maybe about 15 gallons, give yeah. or take. Yeah, gas is uh, definitely a, uh, at a premium right now. And, and recently with the world events going to get more uh, complicated to get. But uh, uh, luckily E85 is uh, quite well used in the ag culture area. And, right. and we got plenty of that around here. So even though you got the race gas in the truck, um, you know, there's other ways to get it around here. Yeah. Oddly enough, I bought it out of uh, Moses Lake at a case IH uh, dealer, tractor dealership. Right. Yeah. I think it, I don't know if it necessarily had to do with tractors. It had uh, the reason they sell it. It had to do with the dunes, the proximity to the dunes and the fact that they're the only ones that have like EPA approved storage facilities that can store E85. Right. So with, with petroleum products, just like your batteries at full throttle to be a dealer or whatever, you have to have certain certifications and logistics in place to store that product. Yeah. And, uh, that's why not just anybody can, can store ga- <laughs> tanks of, uh, of gas on their, on right. the property. So, right. Um, so yeah, you had a bunch of people show up. Uh, you guys went out and ride, uh, basically it's just a big party weekend. Uh, how long were you guys there? I got there on Tuesday, um, Tuesday evening and we started ripping right around then. And, uh, like I said, my, the car ran great up until Friday evening. Had a, yeah, it was a big turnout, man. A lot of fast guys, you know, some, some company guys were there. A lot of industry people were there. I wound up pulling, you know, for, from a business standpoint, I wound up pulling a couple new dealers out of it, three total. Um, <clears throat> so that's always a good thing, but the riding was amazing. The, uh, so how were the dunes in contrast to like last year per se? Perfect. Never rode out there. So we got to define perfect, perfect though, because your def- definition of perfect sometimes doesn't align with everybody else's well, definitions this, of perfect. Well, the sand was really soft, but you know, any, anybody that was new to the sport could have shown up out there. And as long as they, you know, after a couple, you know, 20, 40 miles where they learned to read sand a little bit and not get into the Razorbacks, they would have been comfortable. It was pretty limited in terms of the features that can really hurt you. You know, there was in the flats, there's always witch eyes out there. And in the big dunes, there's always razorbacks, but they weren't really difficult to spot this week. So how was the how was the weather? Uh, we had one day, I want to say, well, Sunday it rained, but it didn't matter to everybody. It was pack, packing up and going home. There was like maybe one little rain flurry. It was cold at night, but uh, during the day when we were out riding, it was amazing. Yeah, I mean, it hit over 60 multiple times, but... I think next year, though, we might try... last year, it was super windy and rainy the whole time we were there, and with little spurts of sunshine yeah. that came through, but yeah. this seemed like it was a lot oh, cleaner. Oh, perfect. Perfect. And it's been 60s out there for quite some time, but we are... Pro- I'm, I'm thinking about pushing the event back a month, you know, just to give give a little break between hammers, and because a lot of the guys that were there were at hammers. Give a little break between that and uh, possibly... Because in late March, it's not uncommon for it to just kind of hold 55 to 60 and that's what we want because it got so cold. Like I brought, I brought cornhole boards and all kinds of fun stuff for nighttime and they never came out of the bag. It was that, it was that cold. You night. just basically hung out in the trailers and whatnot. Yeah. It reminded me of hammers. Hammers was frigid and, uh, goons was no different. Everybody, nobody wanted to get out of the RVs. It was chilly. So speaking of hammers, uh, I don't know if we've necessarily talked about it per se, but, uh, how was hammers? You guys went down there with full throttle and, uh, kind of last minute for you to, to head down there. And, um, you guys set up, t- set up a, a booth uh, with some other friends and how did it all go? I have beef with Johnson Valley and, uh, Johnson Valley had beef with my truck and trailer. It was, it was a brutal week, man. It was, it was dirty. It was cold. Yeah, we had some fun out there. We shot a video that was probably some of the best shots I've seen of uh, full throttle athletes and full the full throttle car out there with uh, Reef. Yeah, yeah, he was out there with that big long lens on that Black Magic, and it was it was great. The uh, the event though, it, it'll take a pint of blood out of you. That's for sure. That's a rough area, and it, the weather was just. It's brutal. It's cold the whole time, which it always is. I mean, there's it's it's always one variant or the other. Like I want to say, two three years ago, the place was just covered in snow, and it was brutal cold. Year before that, or the year after that, I want to say uh, Russell from Buggy Web was telling me it was in the 80s to 90s. 
Right. So you really can't count on anything out there, but yeah, it, it, it was good. The, the, the machines you get to be around the, the racing environment, I think, uh, it was well worth it. A lot of fun. You know, we've got something like 5,000 photos out of it, got a great video out of it. So in terms of being on vendor road though, we're in a product shortage the way that a lot of company, a lot of companies in the, in the United States are. And a lot of our hottest items are hard to get our hands on right now. And to go out there and do a vendor display out at hammers, you need to be able to support people support the racers, support the people that are actually at the event because they're out ripping as well. So really the best benefit that we would have at that show is to have a whole lot of product to sell to people. And yeah, that's uh, one thing that people don't realize don't that at racing, uh, vendor row is, is cool for the spectators, but for a lot of the time you're actually there to support the racing, the teams, the people that are actually participating in the event, not necessarily the community, even though you're, you're there to help them too. You know, like, like I just saw a post with, um, uh, rugged, uh, radios, you know, that whole team went out there to support all the racers, right? Like the whole reason they had the investment in the spot, the tent, the tools, the staff, everything was to make sure that racers were either educated, installed correctly, tuned, ready to go. Race teams had a way to communicate. That's why they were there. <coughs> and so right. a lot of times, like you were saying, you go there to support those that are there. Um, and if you don't have products, it's really hard to do that. So you have to kind of come up creative and, and come up with new ways to, you know, be there and, and support people. Yeah. If you, if you don't have product, you're essentially wasting those guys time. Cause they'll see what you are and they'll be like, they have a need and then they come over to talk to you and surprise can't help you. Right. So, so we just ran cameras all week. So, uh, you were there booth buddies with a few companies. Who were you uh, neighbors with? Uh, buggy whip and pro Eagle. Like we didn't even put out a spread. Like I said, we didn't have a single battery there to sell. So most of the time we just went out and shot, uh, covered, covered a lot of the activities, watched, uh, you know, did you get up into the to the rocks like on the uh, Chocolate Thunder or any of that to go watch any action? Not like we did first year. You know, uh, Ryan, the photographer, did for sure. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, in Hammertown, a ton of time in Hammertown and a ton of time in uh, uh, the RV. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we went out on some rides and stuff like that. During We went out on a great night ride with the addiction crew. Uh, you know, it's all desert out there, so you can hold some pretty pretty fast pace i actually got to drive the new pro r while i was out there i was gonna say shout out to bj and, and trevor yeah. they both uh built uh matching pro r builds uh one green one blue i think yep and uh put some 35s or 37s on them uh 35s i want to say bj's is running sedona 35s on it, if i remember correctly um yeah i got to drive that out there and then at goons and the dunes i got to drive a new uh rr smart shock a 28 two uh yep yep and how was that? Freaking unreal. <laughs> <laughs> so it I, really I've, was, man. I've heard a lot about the 22s. I mean, spec-wise, they're not really any different outside of a tune, right, to get to 200 horsepower. But everyone that I've talked to has said it feels different when you drive it. No, it feels more rear bias, uh, I thought anyway. And I want to say, I can't remember what it had on it for paddles. I want to say maybe like some 1300s or something. Um, but it was bone stock, and I was running it in comfort mode through the whoops on the way out. And it is because my, my low speed compression is set up pretty aggressive. Like my car, my car set up to go really, really fast. And when you're driving it slow, it will beat the crap out of you. There's none of that in that smart shock. That thing rides like a freaking Cadillac. And what about the uh, clutch engagement? That's where they got the new P drive clutch on the primary. Like I've been told that the engagement on that feels a lot more immediate. Like it engages and then you're off to the races. Yeah, I can see that. All I can tell you is there wasn't anything about that car that didn't blow me away. Like it doesn't have the power that my car has, but it makes it the same way. Like my car really comes alive, really throws the weight to the rear and the front end will kind of float, but it does even more so in comfort mode on the new live valve. Like I, I was really impressed with the car and even on stop stock power, like it, it, it does good. Like it's one of those things where it kind of feels like my X3 did on its 3R tune. It's very aggressive. So I was really impressed, but that Pro R though, that Pro R is awesome. No, Did you get a chance to ride a Pro R in the dunes with paddles on it? No, it was uh, it was out in the desert, it, just out in Johnson Valley, and there's some sand sections out there, but we never got to go into it. This is mostly like high speed desert stuff, and yeah, I was. But super, you didn't get to ride paddles in no, Oregon with a Pro R. No, 
Was uh, was Trevor riding paddles or was he riding the 35 knobbies? I think he was on dirt tires still. BJ had paddles on though. And uh, I think he had some tie rod problems or something if I remember right. But yeah, it... Uh, uh, BJ or Trevor? BJ. Yeah, BJ, BJ doesn't ride uh, softly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you get a new machine that that's that fun, man. You want to get out there and you want to test it for sure. But. So looking at the Pro R's tie rods, uh, they have a cast unit that's probably a good... Um, I don't know, two thirds of the control arm from the hub. And then uh, it creates a, a reduced link with a threaded for the adjustment before it gets to the rack. And then from what I've been told that the links on the inside of the rack are quite a bit smaller than the beef that's outside the rack. So where it joins onto the rack inside the housing, inside the boot is a lot smaller. So I'm wondering if maybe he had some problems there. Yeah, I'm not sure. The tie rod... Uh tie rod on those things reminds me a lot of the stock yxz ones i mean they're they're not aggressive by any stretch of the imagination but but they're pretty thick <clears throat> i mean they're the casting i mean is pretty thick I, I i suppose they're thick but it was still talking about a 2200 plus pound car it, that's a uh, that's a big part of it, it right is. how how heavy the car is and yeah. i think um uh the side-by-side -side blog guys they weighed their their pro r's the four seater at like 2800 pounds and the two seater at like 2200 pounds or something like yeah. that they're they're a heavy car yeah they are yeah, the car itself so is really fun. The riding position is amazing. The comfort level is amazing. The just the internal ergonomics of the cab is really comfortable for a guy my size. Visibility is great. The the car, you know, I've been in some class ones. Uh, I've been in a class ten, and that car kind of feels a little bit more like that than an actual side by side. When you're, when you're actually driving when it. you're pushing it. Yeah. It's very, it's rear bias. The front end floats and it floats great. Like, like you just hold the wheel still through whoops and stuff like that. Like my, my turning adjustments weren't even like maybe a quarter inch at most. Like you're just not sitting there just jerking the wheel right. back and so forth. They, just they said that the so ratio good. was uh, modified. So I'm sure you're getting a little bit more ratio on the steering, uh, on the rack and the rack now has the motor on the actual rack instead of up under, underneath the dash. Right. Uh, so you're getting a lot better control and, and instant adjustment that way. Uh, and then did you get a chance to, to play with the riding modes like the desert and rock and all that stuff? Because the Baja mode and all that actually changes the controller on the EPS so that when you're steering, it feels completely different. Yeah. I ran it all in Baja mode the whole time. You know, I think that's its most aggressive setting or the way that it steers as well as its throttle, uh, throttle sense, uh, throttle sensitivity. Right. And, uh, cause it's doing both like a pedal commander type scenario where it's changing your throttle yeah. ratios. And then it's also changing the steering, uh, feedback and it's changing a whole lot of those different things all at once. Right. Yeah. The only complaint that I have about that car is going to get fixed by the aftermarket. You know, it runs, it runs out of breath a little bit up top. Yeah. You know, my car will pull all the way to its red line. Like, so it's funny that I posted a, a picture of a community member that wrecked his pro R and, and the radius rods were exposed because they popped off at the welds. And I've been getting a lot of, a lot of grief on that. And I just talked with uh, Chad at Deviant about that. And, um, you know, he, he took time because he has a new pro R four seater. Uh, he took the radius rods off and they're two inches longer than a turbo S radius rod. And they're three pounds lighter. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so for the people that have been on our social pages and commenting on that post, uh, to clarify, my post wasn't to say, hey, look, the Pro R is breaking. It was that Polaris said these arms, these components were all beefier, stronger, bigger, thicker, able to take the abuse of this car. And I think that only is justified in a few components. I don't think it's across the board. Those radius rods are paper thin and the wet and it broke off right at the weld. So yeah, people really interpreted that post wrong. I don't know what the heck they were thinking. I, I, I want to say it was just kind of a little bit overly sensitive Polaris fans or something getting a little bit testy about that, which I mean, it wasn't like you were out there trying to expose them for building a bunch of, no, cheap it's a cool car. Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, at the end of the day though, and, what, and we need the aftermarket. I mean, that, Replacing parts is part of the equation of putting these cars out. Right. Yeah. I mean, at the at the end of the day, the car wrecked. It, it was in a really really bad wreck. It was it it was, you know, it went it, all the way over off a of dune. Yeah. Tumbled yeah. over, and the only thing wrong with it was that radius rod broke, and then took out the rear arm because of it. Well, and combine that with the fact that the 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 point of the post was the wall thickness of the radius rod. The wall thickness and the and the bung being so small. And that doesn't change, you know. I mean, you, you're looking right at it. You can see exactly what you're looking at right in front of you. The fact that it, the circumstances of which it ripped off are irrelevant. Right. You know, it's just 
it's it it's a component that me personally i would upgrade yeah no it's it definitely uh was one of those things it's like you know if i had my my way and i had unlimited money i would have i would buy these cars and just completely dissect them and, and put that content out there. But the only way for me to get access to that information is to see what the community does with these things. So uh, when somebody does show a component uh, failing, it's interesting to learn and take have takeaways from that lesson just to inform the community at large. And I find that very interesting that, you know, the big push, the marketing push was bigger, beefier, you're stronger. And this is one of those components that's supposed to be bigger, beefier and stronger. The, 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 the top rod is, I think, inch and a half. The bottom rod is inch and three quarter or something like that. They're, they're pretty big components, but unfortunately, the uh, the the wall diameter uh, thickness and all that stuff just didn't come along with that size increase. So, right, right. But uh, I'm excited. I got to, to when I was over at uh, Deviant, got to see some of their components, and we're looking at putting a bunch of their parts on the car on the on Uncle Ben's Razor. Uh, the radius rods on that thing are going to be so freaking beefy. I mean, I could, they're about the size of the drive shaft on the on the XP. So they're 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 solid <laughs> and uh i think they're 120 wall and uh yeah i don't think that car's gonna have any kind of uh radius rod problems in the for future. sure yeah i saw some guys are starting to do some power stuff on that thing if i remember right larue pushed uh yep. pushed a lot of boost through it and then it tapped out but obviously if you're doing any sort of horsepower development you're going to wind up tapping those things out eventually if i remember right i want to say that that two liters something like 12 to 1 12.5 to 1 so and be really careful when you start throwing boosts. So I don't know what you would do. I don't, I don't know what the simplest process to lower that compression would be. Maybe a little bit of a thicker head gasket or something. But they'll they'll get that stuff figured out. I think I think that motor could really benefit from some computer work right off the bat because, like I said, it, it really starts to lose power as you get higher up in the RPM. I don't know what the elevation is in Johnson Valley. It's probably not a heck of a lot. But uh, um, that was the only complaint about the, uh, about that I had about the car. I love the way that it handled out of the, out of, out of the gate. Um, BJ's car is like a plus four. So it's really freaking wide. And, uh, yeah, I, I was blown away. I was really, really stoked on that rig. Like, like you could really charge through, like you can charge whoops pretty hard in my car, but in that thing, that thing feels more like a four seater than a two seater, you know, being as long as yeah, wide the wheelbase as definitely contributes to the way that car feels. Right. And a lot of people are saying that it's a happy medium between a two seat and a four seat where you get, a lot of the length and controllability of a four seat when you're going through whoops and things like that, but you're getting a lot of the nimbleness of having a two seater. So, um, no, I think those cars are, are just going to be awesome. I can't wait to see what the, uh, uh, the turbo are, you know, how that handles and, and being the similar wheelbase as the previous pro XP and, but having all the new suspension components and, the added weight and all that. I, I'm really interested to see how that car handles. Yeah. And unfortunately, there was only a handful, I think two, maybe three at, at hammers that were competing. And I think those are the only ones that exist uh, up to that point. <laughs> so Yeah, they put them in their own class, if I remember right, too. And The were, turbos? Uh, the new Pro R, yeah. Oh, well, the Pro that. R yeah. has, yeah, an unlimited class that they're in. Yeah, um, they, they put them in their own class and then everybody's like look they went one two well they were the only two in the class <laughs> <laughs> so. that there's a whole story to be had there for, yeah, sure. for sure um but you know when you're starting a new class that's how it starts you don't have competitors until you do yeah. and so that's just what they had but uh you know there's marketing reasons for that and and, and they'll capitalize on that for a long yeah. time because i mean they really closed the gap on that x3 though i mean uh, a lot of this stuff everything is, i've seen is they're neck to neck well it's so rider you know it's so dependent on what you want out of a rig driving position and stuff like that but in terms of like where an x3 is when you buy it off the shelf you know let's just say its baseline is here well the pro r in my opinion is uh eclipsed it you know for me and the reason i say that is i think it's just crazy freaking versatile i'm so damn comfortable in that thing yeah you know i just think that uh you know where the where the aftermarket supports the x3 it's you can build an X3 into anything you want, but give it a give it a year, maybe two years, and let the aftermarket catch up on that Pro R. That's going to be a car that's that's going to be freaking unreal. Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> they definitely definitely closed the gap on the X3 22, the RR models that that have come out. And and if any test you've seen, they pretty much if you're comparing stock to stock, they're neck and neck. Like the, there might be one edging out the other or whatever, but I don't consider that a one a win one way or the other. I say that they're basically performing on the same playing field right and uh the interesting part will be in the aftermarket the tunes the upgrades the horsepower uh, uh freaks out there that, that upgrade these cars um the biggest drawback though is that they've met the x3 
but with an additional, you know, four or five, 600 pounds. And that's really where the winners are going to be defined on who's lighter, more nimble, able to take the abuse, even though they have the upgraded shocks and all that, you can't stop physics. When you have that much rolling mass going down the racetrack, it takes a lot more energy to, to control it around the corners and through the whoops and all that stuff. And it can handle that. But when you're in a race environment, that's a different story. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out and, and how that car performs and why I'm super interested on the turbo R just because, you know, there are a bunch of aftermarket performance upgrades and there are a bunch of racers and a bunch of classes that it can compete in now, you know, and have competition versus, you know, the pro R that's all by itself. So it'll be definitely interesting to see that. I think, uh, Kristen Matlock just got one. So she'll be racing, uh, the not, she can mint 400. She's racing somewhere with it, uh, the rest of the season with it. I think, um, uh, the Romo's got their pro R's and they're going to be racing those the rest of the season after their next race. Uh, so the pro R race support is starting to roll out and you're going to start seeing a lot of that. So what, what you're going to start seeing is a whole lot of Polaris athletes racing each other. <laughs> so yeah. we'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, in terms of them expediting that process, I'll bet you every pro R they make for the next 18 months will be sold before it ever lands on a showroom floor. So I, I don't know how desperate they'd feel like they need to be to get that race program developed. I mean, if it helps the aftermarket, that's cool. But I mean, I'm already seeing some stuff where guys that have put in orders for pro R's have gotten delayed, you know, 90 days here, maybe another 90 days here. They got their initial deadline and got pushed. But I mean, the broad scheme of things, 90 days isn't a big deal, especially in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, it's freaking, what, March 1st, March 2nd right now. And uh, it, so what if you don't get it till May? It's not a lot of riding to be had in the mountains. Well, it depends on what kind of rider you are. There are some people out riding right now in the slush and, and all that stuff in the mountains. So. Oh, for sure. For sure. I'm just, you know, if, if sand dunes are your trip, you're, you're not missing the primo right. time of year to go out there. The, the bigger interesting story there is that they've changed the package that people have bought. So people have bought either the ultimate, the sport, whatever, the premium in the middle. Uh, but they basically came out and said, we have too much of a chip shortage to recover from. And anybody that did not buy an ultimate is not going to get Wi-Fi in their ride command. They're not going to get a number of different uh, components of that system. Um, and so they're actually downgrading those cars and updating the SKUs. And then if you don't want to wait for what you ordered an additional six months or whatever the case is, then you basically cancel your order, get back in line and start with a different product. Mm. So that'll be interesting to see how much of that happens and how much of a you know, consu consumer feedback, uh, whiplash there is on that. Yeah. I know that our buddy, um, Hastings, uh, White Hastings, uh, his dad, um, uh, why am I forgetting Doug? Uh, they had an order in and they got screwed out of that deal on theirs. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of new vehicles, uh, didn't a certain North Carolina company, UTV developer <laughs> talk about some patents and stuff that you posted the other day? <laughs> so, yeah, last month uh got a little name drop on the uh, live stream on Speed UTV's uh, weekly live stream thing. Uh, and it was more or less just because um, the patents that I had posted uh, gave them some insight into Polaris contemplating a bulkhead design front diff uh, similar to what Robbie's designed on the Speed UTV. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if they actually do come out with something like that or if it was just Polaris kind of the, the patent... Um, <clears throat> you know, drawers, uh, taking some freedom and liberty and, in, in simplifying the design a little bit, yeah. uh, for what they were doing. But, uh, if, if players wants to come out with a, a front bulkhead design, you know, that's interesting. That's cool. Um, I still feel like unless you're going to do a super high end car, uh, a, a solid front bulkhead design doesn't really play nice with how much abuse these cars take and how many times they get broken. So it'll be interesting. I've had a few discussions with, you know, that team uh, over the last couple months and hopefully here relatively soon, we'll start to see them actually start to put cars out and, and start racing cars and, and all that stuff. So it'll be interesting to see the, the progression um, on the speed UTV, you know, how it performs in the race series. I got to imagine and we're going to see them next week down in Vegas. I hope so. Uh, I haven't quite got a message out. I was going to ask them if they were going to be there or not. Um, and so I'm, um, 
right after this podcast, I'll probably send him a message and just say, hey, just FYI, we're going to be there. Are you going to be there? Let's hook up. Yeah. Whatever. Spoiler alert. We're going to be in Vegas. <laughs> so speaking of which, I think I might have talked about this on a previous podcast, but uh, next week on a week from today, basically, uh, we'll be driving down to Vegas and uh, doing a little road trip, me and my brother, Uncle Ben, and uh, he's going to be my cam- my my wingman. He's going to be shooting photos while I shoot video. It'll be a good time. Uh, we rented a bunch of equipment, so we'll have all sorts of long lenses and stuff like that. We've got a 2 to 600 coming. Um, got some new camera bodies, whatnot. So we should be able to get a lot of content. Uh, hopefully, we can you know help contribute and support some of these brands that we support, uh, including Full Throttle um, and some of the other guys out there. Uh, it was interesting talking with uh, the Martellis about their licensing agreements and, and stuff like that. Um, they've pretty much got that on lockdown as far as if you want to use content from their uh, series, you're going to be paying for it. So it'll be interesting to see how we do that. So most of the licensing agreement is a free and open license. You just can't make money off of it. So gotcha. I'll have to like, if I make a video for the Mint, we'll have to demonetize it and all that stuff to abide by their license. So it'll be interesting. That is very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going down. I'm going to be there. What day are you leaving? So we're leaving Tuesday, yeah. the day before. Uh, and the idea being that it's a, I think it's like a 16 and a half hour drive from where we're at to Vegas. Uh, and then we're going to be staying on, um, uh, what's the strip there? Um, they do the parade on. Fremont. Um, Fremont. Uh, we'll be staying on Fremont uh, pretty much right at the, I think the end of the parade. Tech. So uh, hopefully we'll have a pretty good place to kind of walk back and forth and, and stage out of and, and it'll be easy to kind of get in and out of the event. Uh, so we should have a good time. I, I really want to kind of cover that Fremont experience, the the downtown takeover and, and cover all the, the racers there. It's rad. Um, and I know you've had some experience down there before and had some fun driving down the closed streets of Fremont. Um, <laughs> wish we had uh, some content from that, but we don't. Oh, you, you, you <laughs> made me drifting on the Las Vegas Boulevard? In your YXZ? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was um, epic. But uh, so it should be good. And then I think uh, Friday, Saturday are the race days, right? So then we'll be headed out to the race in prim and then uh, the idea is is that we'll have vests and be out on the racetrack and covering you know getting some good shots and some good content yeah we're uh i'm flying in on wednesday and so is my co-worker we'll probably spend most of the wednesday uh, wednesday thursday and part of friday down at tech and then we'll run out to prim i don't, I don't know how far it is from vegas to prim it's like 30 50 miles give or take but, i think it's like a 30 minute drive or something yeah it's not too far but we uh We'll probably, I've got a slew of a uh, big agenda while we're down there. We'll be doing a lot of the same things you're doing, just sh- taking pictures and kind of networking. Are I'm, you guys vending? No. No? No. I pulled the plug on that a while ago because it's just, you know, we weren't getting ROI on it. You know? Especially when you don't have product. Right. Well, at that time we had tons. But now, now just the ROI on it, we, we gotta be, we gotta be at some of the shows where people are actually out riding. It makes a lot more sense for us. So it, you know, Mint 400 was a great show for us to go network at, but we can probably do a lot of that networking just person to person and not be tied down to a booth. Right. Yeah. When you got a booth and have to staff it, it's always yeah. a bigger logistical issue. Whenever I go to Vegas, I usually always stay at the Wynn. Like the Wynn's like one of the nicest hotels in Vegas. And people think this is crazy amounts of money. Like if nothing's going on, it's like 130 bucks a night. I mean, it's nothing. And every one of those hotels knows when there's a big event in town. <laughs> Cause that, like the win for the mint is like 400 a night. Oddly enough, the cheapest hotel I found, um, well, the cheapest hotel I found was the Rio, but no, thank you. Um, <laughs> I can't remember what the, what is it? Uh, the, the Aria, R-I-A, A-R-I-A, which is like one of the, you know, neck and neck with the wind is the nicest. And it was one of the cheapest ones in town. So we're staying there and kind of commuting to Prim from Vegas Boulevard the whole week. So, so I found a place it was fairly cheap, pretty, pretty affordable, uh, for a double queen, uh, right there on Fremont. And uh, in their courtyard, they have a, a putting green. So oh, sick! I'm I'm all set. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. We've got uh, got a few dinners lined up. Uh, I've got Wednesday and Thursday booked. Working on Friday and Saturday, and then we're gonna fly. Are you driving home on Sunday? We're driving home Sunday. Uh, yeah, we fl- start leave early and and try to get back before midnight. Yeah, I think I'm flying out about six in the evening or something. So 
Be yeah, it was week. kind of interesting. We were looking at flights versus driving. It was basically the same amount of money. So. Oh, it is. Yeah, for sure. I, I It's actually probably a little bit more to, to fly now. You know, I booked my ticket a little bit late, but nonetheless. Yeah. Well, I'm, I don't know. <laughs> with the way gas prices are going, it, it might be a lot more expensive by could, the time we're done with it. Yeah, it could be for sure. But uh, yeah, so headed to Mint. Uh, should be a good time. Um, you know, I've never been to the Mint. It's always been on my bucket list to go check it out. And uh, this time covering it for uh, the channel, for the website, for, you know, the other brands that we work with. It'll be a lot of fun. And hopefully um, I'll take the podcasting stuff down with us and, and maybe be able to con- connect with some some people that we know and some brands we know and maybe get some content uh, done uh, while we're there. So look forward to that. Um, look forward to the rest of the season. This uh, season is kind of turned over from what it was a month ago for me. Uh, so this whole new uh, 2022 is going to be an uh, interesting year for us. I got a lot of projects to release uh, and announce, uh, including some new websites and things like that. So uh, look forward to those. Uh, I just haven't quite got all my ducks in a row to, to have put that video out yet. So um, look forward to that. Look forward to <coughs> working with a lot of new brands that we haven't worked with in the past. I have uh, the shop just about cleaned up enough to start shooting the resolution to a number of videos that have been waiting to be finished. So uh, look forward to those. Uh, got some reviews coming out along with some other uh, content. So a lot of stuff happening. Uh, anything happen- happening after Mint for you in the near future? Um, I will be gone the entire month of April. Uh, go to Full Size Invasion in San Hollow to um, Easter Jeep in Moab. Uh, I'll be home maybe 48 hours to 72 hours in the third week. And then I go to uh, Daytona Beach, Florida for... Uh, the hell they call it jeep beach apparently it's i i heard i heard a number like six hundred thousand people going to town that for would that. be crazy it's gonna yeah happens. it's gonna be nuts well i mean they can probably they probably got the infrastructure to support that many people in there but we've got a booth Is that's that going many in jeep people oh, in yeah. california in oh, florida though <laughs> dude the, the, <laughs> Like we, we, I thought it was all like Chryslers and Cadillacs. Dude, and, we do we do off roading out here in the West, and we do a really good job of it. But I mean, the sales numbers on the East Coast versus here are just it's it's different. It's a lot more population over there. It is, yeah, it's a big deal over there. Um, in Florida, I would assume they have a lot of mudding too, but I don't know how much of that would be represented in Florida. Yeah, I'm not sure. You know, one thing that really kind of shocked me is the the overland community in the Pacific Northwest. There's a really, really strong presence up here, but it's starting to develop more and more and more from Arkansas east. I was going to say the Southwest is starting yeah. to adopt it, and that's becoming more prevalent. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you the one thing I'm most excited about, though, is I had a certain map show up while I was gone down in Winchester. So I basically memorized that map last night, getting a plan together to go tackle a 880 mile journey across Wyoming. That's going to be bitching, and that's probably Wyoming's not short of any good looking scenery. Yeah, um, I I have a lot to figure out between then and now. Um, just kind of having some preliminary conversation. I don't even think I can take. I don't think I can take the X3, the way that it's tuned and stuff like that. Even if we were to back it down to a 91, when we get it up over 11,000 feet, it's probably going to be a little bit of a problem. So my well, fo- you don't even have storage on that right now. <laughs> well, no, I've, I've got some solutions for it. I, I was ready, you know, no question about it. But um, now it's just going to be getting the Pro ready to go do those. So definitely going to be taking the Pro, which means one thing. It means going slower, but more comfortable. Right. And that's okay. Yeah. There's not... Yep. Uh, if anything I've learned from the BDR is it's, it's take it easy, enjoy the, enjoy the journey, see the things and have the stories to tell when you get back. Yeah. You don't have to get as strategic with that four seater either. If you think you need it, bring it cause there's room. Yeah. I mean, the only way that would be impact you would be on, on fuel consumption and the handling. Right. But if you've got your upgraded springs, if you've got, you know, some of those things figured out already, uh, shouldn't be too much of a big deal. Yeah, we got that monster rack on it with all those LPs. You know, we've got those LP sixes and LP fours on it. I might actually get all that. We'll see. You know, there's a nah. Oh yeah, man. There's a rooftop tent company talking to me about putting up a freaking pop up that's forty five pounds up there. You know, when I was down at Hammers, Jolene Van View was down there, and she works with a pop up tent company, and she has one on the top of her Pro XP. And I asked her, I go, so what, what's it doing? Jolene is from Nitro Circus and MTV's Jackass. I, I was asking, like, so what, is it, uh, what does it do for your handling characteristics? She's like, oh, yeah, I know it's there. 
Oh, yeah. For sure. We need to work on it. You know, 45 pounds on the top of my X3, you would never notice it. And uh, the Pro might be the same type of thing. Yeah, I, I think it comes down just to the mass. Not necessarily the weight, but just how much physical yeah. mass is there. Well, there's and 45 pounds easily just in lights on the top of that thing in conjunction <laughs> with that true. rack. Those, those Baja design lights are not uh, yeah. lightweight. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we might just route some of those lights a little bit further south on the car. Maybe just get them a little lower and... Um, it, it'll be overland worthy. Yeah. It already has. I mean, I've, I've, I've proven that, you know, we took it out. I, I had a little bit of trouble with it on the Idaho run, but, but ultimately I can't complain. It did a great job. It went in a limp mode once, which I just turned it off, fired it back up and we we're good. Um, and you guys solved that, right? Wasn't it like a ground issue or a, something like that? Oh, that was unrelated. That was, there was something messed up in the actual manufacturing of that car. There was a, there was a ground that, uh, in the fuse block or something. Yep, and it was it was cross threaded, but not making good enough contact. And then to rip it off would have just basically sheared the bolt. Uh, so we just soldered it. Uh, Will Will at Superior soldered it actually, and uh, we haven't had a temperature spike or voltage spike since. Yeah, no, ground's crossed. a huge thing on these cars, and yeah. people don't realize just how important that is. Yeah. Car's been running great though, man. Down in Johnson Valley, I was pushing the heck out of it, and it uh, it did did great. No complaints. And we idled it a long time, and that's where you get into trouble with that. Before that got fixed, that's where it would start to expose itself is when it was sitting there idling. Yeah, the sensors are going crazy, not getting the readings they're expecting, right. and, and it feels like it's about to die, so it's trying to compensate, but when it does, it's backwards than what it needs, and blah, 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 blah. So, right. Um, cool. <coughs> Holy hey, cow. how about you try not to kill everybody's ears? I know. Uh, speaking of the pro right now, man, um, not to let any cats out of the bag, but... I, I took it. I think you're a professional cat out of the bagger. I am. <laughs> uh, I took it down to, it's in, it's at our home office in Camarillo. <laughs> I threw out a comment to him. I go, don't give this back to me until it's the loudest pro in the entire West Coast. And it, SSV said, challenge accepted. <laughs> and it's getting all kinds of sauce right now. So we'll see. We might have to put an alternator kit on that thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, when you start running a lot of wattage through your speakers, it, it can draw down your batteries pretty quick. It can, you know, and, and that thing's running like a 650 stator, and that's not enough for huge yeah. audio. And the, like the Pro R, it's got a <clears> freaking <throat> like 1500 or something like that stator on it now. So, and that's a belt. Oh, the one. new one? Yeah. Yeah, it's got an alternator. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it'll be interesting to see, you know, by the summertime or maybe even next SEMA, like just what some of these audio guys do with the Pro R, like four seat, yeah, how big those systems are going to be <laughs> when they come out. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you got going on over the next couple of months? Let's just say after the mint, what's, uh, what's April, May look like? So the mint is kind of my big hoorah for the year at the moment. Um, going to try to experience as much as I can get it, capture as much as I can while I'm there, uh, which is going to lead to a lot of video editing. So there'll be a lot of seat time on the editor there. Uh, I got the Idaho BDR, uh, or I'm sorry, the Washington BDR to finish up. I got, um, all the clips, uh, cut up and ready to organize into the next last two episodes of that. Uh, and then I have the Idaho BDR project, which I want to finish, uh, as soon as possible. Uh, what's going to require some, I think some more interviews, uh, maybe some shop interviews or whatever to kind of round that one out. I want to do a good job on that. Um, and I'm not sure if that one's going to be episodic like the Washington one, or if it's going to be a single full featured film. What's your thoughts on that in terms of like, what are you telling yourself your timeline is? Are you going to try and get it out by like May or June or something? Um, at this point, uh, it's too hard for me to, to figure out what the timeline would be because I haven't div dove into the content enough to n get a good idea of what actual storylines there. Uh, because for those that aren't familiar, we brought some filmers out uh, on the Idaho BDR and the Washington BDR uh, with the intention that they were going to put that out on MAV TV. You know, there would be an actual episode of content generated from that stuff. About that. Um, it never <laughs> happened. Uh, and so that content fell into my laps and I wanted to give them enough time to like logistically like respect their creative process and say, you know, you did the content capture. You have the time to create whatever you're going to do out of this. That never happened. So after I gave them the appropriate, what I felt the appropriate amount of freedom to do so, um, then it was my job to take over that project and put these pieces of content out. So the Washington BDR, um, uh, it, well, there was enough like vloggy stuff to kind of make a story happen. So that kind of worked out for us. Idaho, I haven't dove in to see if there's enough of that yet. 
Um, I think that with that one, I want to have a lot more a roll where we talk to the camera and, and tell the story of what happened. Cause there's a lot of nuance with that trip that wasn't told with the cameras. So I want to kind of round out the storyline um, a bit on that one. And I think that's going to take a bit more time, but I definitely want it out this summer. Well, food, food for thought. Uh, I have to go get the pro probably 60 days from now, right around the first of May, give or take. And if you wanted to do some A-roll stuff, interview stuff, we could probably get Bam, Brandon, and, and uh, Wes on camera if you wanted to roll down with me. You're talking about when we go to Mint? When I go or, to go get the pro. Oh, it's when you go down to Southern California yeah. to get the car. So, uh, yeah, so that, that project is just, I've been trying not to stress myself out on all the different things I got going on. Uh, with, so that one's just kind of been held off until the Washington's done. And then I'll start on to Idaho and figuring that out. And then it'll probably take me a good solid two weeks to get that content cut up to where we actually have all the pieces. And then, um, then we can actually say, okay, we'll start putting the storyline together, start art, you know, storyboarding it and putting where, where are we missing pieces and put that together. And I'm hoping my, my, my desire would be to have a single film that we can put out and, and actually have like a little trophy that we can put out for people to enjoy. Um, but if we have to break it up into episodic content, then, then that's what I'll do. Yeah. If you did one single one, it would be long and I would, I would recommend to people to stick it through cause, uh, that, that scenery just gets more and more beautiful. Yeah. No, there was definitely no shortage of awesome things to see and, and experience. So that trip just had a lot of storyline to it. And I really want to kind of hone in on the experience of that trip. So. Yeah. Yeah, I was planning on uh, doing three guided runs this year, and I know I'm doing one for sure, uh, another one in Wyoming for sure, and uh, I was thinking about doubling up on an Idaho run. I might not have time. We'll see. Yeah. It's just, it's it's going to be a busy year, man. Like when I did, <clears throat> perfect time of year to go do stuff like this is early September, maybe late August. You know, it's fire season, so you're contending with that. But looking at my calendar, it's just nuts. It's freaking nuts. Like, I actually think I'm going to be home four months this year. That's about it. I think the, uh, looking back at the, you know, the BDRs from that we are, that we're creating the content for now, we did those in June and July. And I think June was a pretty fantastic time to do that. If you look back at the weather on that trip, it was pretty comfortable. Well, it was inclement. And honestly, I like that. I, I like it when it gets mixed up a little bit. I mean, I've only been on one of these guided trips once where I was like, I could really use an HVAC freaking Ranger right now. Um, but that was like a three, four hour window and then things got better. But my recollection of Washington was pretty good. We got, we got into some pretty heavy wind and cold weather up out of Wenatchee, but it was nothing where we were just hating life by any stretch yeah i mean the worst that happened was i wanted to keep the windshield up for a little while and with my jacket on like that was the worst that we really ran right. into so yeah june in the cascades though can still be a little inclement so if you want to go out and ride those trails beware yeah so uh speaking of bdr i've had a number of conversations with guys that are looking forward to this year getting out and doing some of these bdr trips uh washington idaho uh, some of these Northwest ones that we've actually participated on and they're, they're just doing chunks, right? Like they're just going to do kind of a day ride out, day ride back type scenarios. Um, and I encourage that anyone that look is looking for a good time, a good weekend, um, you know, pack what you need for a two day trip and put it in the car and go out and do it. Like yeah. there's no reason not to go enjoy the outdoors this year. Yeah. If you want to knock out the whole thing in one in undertaking, it's, it's a beast. You know, the easiest way to do it is to put a truck on a trailer in one portion of the state, go down and back. And in Idaho, that's a, it's a 10 day proposal. Uh, Washington, Washington, you could probably do it in five, maybe even a little bit less if you're really on the gas. Uh, but as far as what I'm looking at in Wyoming, I'm going to have to put my truck and trailer in Sheridan and he'll link up with a Penske truck in their billings and then drive two machines down into the southern portion, find a Penske drop-off point, get a ride back to the trailhead, and then go send it until we get to... Yeah, real similar to what we portion. did in Idaho. 100% but, just like we did it in Idaho. But I've been talking to a lot of guys that are just wanting to get out and experience something. And yeah. just like you did in Idaho where it's like, you know, you spend a day going out and a day, a day going back or whatever the case may be, um... People just need to know that they can do that. Yeah. And, well, and there are resources there for you to go figure these things out. It yeah. just takes a little bit of effort. And then once you've done it, 
you know, it's going to feel like second nature just to say, yeah, let's, let's pack up and go do something. Well, in terms of, uh, I mean, it's all personal preference and stuff, but don't sleep on Washington. It's absolutely gorgeous, especially as you get into the central part of the state. Like when, when you run from highway 12 to highway 20, that is kind of the bread and butter of the, the beauty. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like once you get up out of Conconally, it's still gorgeous, but I think Washington's easier to tackle. You got bigger towns to work with, no shortage of resources, and you can flat out go faster. You know, it, mm-hmm. uh, Idaho is uh, Idaho is long. It's remote. It's really pretty. You're gonna spend a lot of time wheeling through some meadows. You know, the, I would say the wheeling is better in Washington because the roads aren't kept as good. Yeah, Idaho's faster in that it's more of a groomed trail, yeah. versus Washington has a lot more rocky and and dips and ruts and stuff like that. But that cascade view. It's unreal. Uh, when you get north of Chelan and all that, like, is it north of Chelan? South nah, of Chelan? the the big cascade views are uh, just off Highway 12. You, you yeah. know, you got Rainier in sight. You've got, uh, I mean, there's, yeah. And, it's, and a lot of those peaks that you ride along that trail actually have camp spots, like legitimate camping grounds. And yeah. so I encourage people to, to check out those maps because, I'm looking forward to taking the family up to some of those trails. Yeah, one of the easiest and best sections if you're going to go tackle Idaho is the Magruder Corridor. Like you could literally just go to Darby, Montana, right over to Elk City, Idaho and back. That's gorgeous. It's uh, depending on where you stage out of. It's about 65 miles one way, 65 back unless you go all the way to Elk City. Then it's about, oh, it's probably close to 100 there, 100 back, which, you know, they've got fuel. So it's really no problem, but that is a gorgeous view going through the uh, Frank Church Wilderness. And as we saw on, on Idaho, something to take into consideration is if your car can handle cheap gas or not. <laughs> so if you got your car all hopped up and, and sensitive to changes, uh, these small little towns, their gas supply is not quite the big city gas supply. So Yeah, you've got uh, 87 octane at a lot of places. I don't know, some guys would just run some octane boost. I never did. And that was on a 3R tuned X3. I would just literally put on 87 and just stay out of the turbo. You know, I just wouldn't push the car hard. Yeah, there was there was times where I threw some boost into into the fuel supply, but just where I didn't feel comfortable with the age of the gas in the station, like how often they'd be filled up, right? So a lot of the times, like even the one gas stations that took out some of the Can-Ams on our trip um, that fouled their plugs up and stuff, my the XP turbo had no problems eating that gas up for dinner. So yeah, that thing would probably run on Coors Light if you asked it to. But we <laughs> if I had it. the money, we might try it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe when we go it around to rebuild that car, we try something stupid like that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so no, and and as far as the you know the next couple months or whatever, I'm I'm really dedicating the next couple months to finishing content, getting the BDR Idaho BDR started finishing up the projects in the garage, getting the car running and out in the out shooting the car again. Um, a lot of these things that have just gotten put off with the event season last year and, and all that stuff being so far behind now, I'm trying to play catch up in this first quarter so that the ne- rest of the year can be all just gung-ho content creation. Yeah. It's going to so, be a busy year. Yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, anything happening later on the year that you're looking forward to? Uh, 340 horsepower to the wheels. I mean, anyone would look forward to that. Yeah. But. <laughs> Uh, but it's as far coming. as, but as far as events or things that you're going to be looking at doing besides maybe some of these trips, uh, any events or anything that is new or different or the, uh, the two events that I'm looking forward to most is Overland Expo West and Flagstaff and then Overland Expo Northwest in Bend, Oregon. And there's a, there's a little bit of hubbub behind the scenes where we're thinking about doing a run into or out of Redmond, Redmond slash Bend where you know, one of the, uh, there's a couple of producer guys that we've worked with that want to shoot maybe like a three, four day BDR style run in and out of those events. Whether it happens or not, we'll see. But uh, those are the two events I look forward to the most because you just get such a weird assortment of vehicles. There's just no shortage of candy. And you're starting to see more and more UTVs in that space as well. And me being <clears throat> me being a guy that's been doing overlanding on a UTV for, I mean, what year are we in? 2022? Uh, Three and a half years. Four, four years now. Um, I, I, 
it's cool to see yeah. for sure. And well, and the nice thing is that the manufacturers are starting to catch on to it, right? So they're starting to put money behind it and put products into the market and things like that. Yeah, you're starting to see like modular rack systems and stuff for the back of four seaters where you yep. can slide trays out and store tools, store gear. I don't, I don't, I mean, maybe I'll get into something that crazy down the road, but it would have to be with a dedicated build. I, I still like to run lean and mean, you know, when you've got a, when you've got a, uh, a pro XP with a turbo or an X3, they make a X amount of power. You want to be able to use it and they provide a suspension dynamics that you want to be able to use. And part of the reason, you know, I've always told people this the reason I overland on UTVs is because I don't have an exorbitant amount of vacation time. And if you were to go tackle the Washington BDR and my FJ, you'd probably take anywhere from five days on the short side up to eight to nine to get it all done while still conserving your vehicle and not destroying it. Well, a UTV will do it in two and a half. Yeah. You, no, can just, you can just hold better. You can hold a safer, safer and uh, faster pace. Yeah. And, 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 not and that's not it. saying that you're being unsafe on the trails. It's just that there's logistics in the tra- terrain and your suspension and all that stuff and the weight of the vehicle and, and a lot of those things. So there's a lot of benefits to taking a truck out and doing it. There's a lot of benefits to a UTV. It's just kind of which ones you want to deal with. Well, you get up onto Rim Rock off of Highway 12 there, you can hold 35 miles an hour in a UTV and the art suspension will just articulate and that road is just literally just beat to crap. It's the type of thing I'd be doing five to six miles an hour in my Toyota. And Otherwise, or, you'd vibrate it to Or that. just something as simple as like the the lookout tower on the Magruder, right? When we got up to Burnt Knob, um, that that little climb up to the lookout. It's one mile. Is is roughly a mile. Take 50 and minutes in a full-size road. <laughs> with our UTVs, it took us 45 seconds, a minute and a half, something like that. Well, it's, it's exactly one mile to get to the, literally to the nose. I think to get to the top of it, if you know it's it's three to four minutes whereas in a in a uh full-size truck like the way that i take care of my stuff I, i'd be just creeping yeah it, know, it, I, it could take you up to an hour good. like like it, 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 just with it all those really rocks could. and yeah. all that stuff if you're if you're wanting to crawl over stuff and not move it off the trail and all that stuff like it, it could take a while now if you really want to go up it fast the first year i did it was on a husk bar in a 501 and I caught air when I crested that. <laughs> that I, I was all over that bike. In fact, it was overheating by the time I got to the top of it. I yeah. raged up that thing. And it was there, a blast. There's some gnarly terrain on some of those lookouts and things like that. So, but there's a, it's a lot of, it's worth it. You get oh, to yeah. the top. I mean, it's just, it's 100%. worth it. So, uh, so yeah, let's just wrap this up. Uh, had a great time uh, at Deviant last week. Uh, if you haven't seen that episode, go check it out. Uh, we got a lot of content coming. We got the mint coming up next week. So there's going to be a ton of content jumping out of that on social media. So make sure to follow us online at side by side uh, you should vlog that. And, uh, I am going to be vlogging cool. that. Yeah, no, we'll be, we'll be doing road trip vlogging with uncle Ben and, uh, we'll see what else things we can figure out along the way. There's plenty to stop and see, but short 24 hours to put a 16 hour drive into. So, well, I, I need you guys there by noon. <laughs> or two, two thirty on to, Wednesday. Yeah, to pick me up from the airport. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you guys got the whole team going down, right? I got a bunch of people going, man. Yeah. So uh, look forward to a lot of content from that. Uh, look forward to seeing what kind of podcast or whatever we can record while we're there. Uh, definitely going to have lots of photos, lots of videos to share on social media, things like that. Uh, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all those places. You can find us on the podcast apps at Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, all the different places. And if you would, we would appreciate a five-star review. That helps us out, pop up above everybody else, even though we are the top-ranked side-by-side searched podcast on the internet. So uh, we enjoy uh, doing the podcast. We enjoy everybody participating with us, and we look forward to a full season of awesome content coming your way. So until the next time, guys, peace. Peace.